welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobre. If you've got your Bibles, tonight we're going to be looking at the favor of God. So I'm going to be speaking on the favor. I've got a lot of information to give you. You don't want to probably sit here in a Bible study. You're tired, but I'm going to have to lay some foundations so that you can understand what the favor of God is and how important it is in our lives. So we're going to look into the Word tonight. We're going to be in a lot of places. So if you could just take your Bible, put it in your hands, stand up with me, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the living Word of God. We thank you that we have the capacity by the power of the Holy Spirit to open your word and to understand your words. It's your will that we know your will. It's your will that we understand the kingdom of God. And so tonight, Lord, as we open the word, may the word open us. As we listen to the spirit of the living God teach us tonight, may, Lord, you open our ears and may we hear what you want us to hear. Lord, I just pray in my weakness and in my frailty that, Lord, the things that don't need to be said would just not be said tonight. The things that do need to be said, that you would highlight them in the heart of your people. God, I pray that our minds would be steadfast and focused tonight, that we wouldn't miss what you want us to hear. I pray that we would be a family here in the Inland Empire that would love Jesus more and more and more. And walk in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven in our generation. So now for those that are sick among us, Lord, if you're sick in your body right now, I just want you to lift your hand up. Father, we just ask that you'd, you'd just take the pain away, that you'd heal these bodies right now. They don't need to be sick in, in the house of God tonight. So I just thank you for the healing presence in the name of Jesus I thank you for those that are wandering minds right now that we just thank you, Father, that we have the mind of Christ. We're focused in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On your way down, we're going to be looking at the favor of God. This is called Favor, the God Factor. This actually could be a series. Got a lot to say tonight, so I may not get it all in, and that's all right. Not going to keep you forever, but I think it's an important topic. I think the favor of God is something we maybe don't quite understand or get or we don't wake up every morning expecting God's favor and even knowing what favor is. So let me just talk to you about what favor is. Now in the Old Testament, there's several Greek, there's several Hebrew words for favor. You don't speak Hebrew and neither do I. But it can mean many things. And one of the words in the Hebrew is is the word for delight. That when you have God's favor on you that There is a delight on your life, that God delights in me with the favor of God, that he's pleased with me, that he actually wants to be with me and bless me and give me his favor and his benefit and his blessing. In the New Testament, the basic word for favor is the word that we have for grace, haris, and it means We've been, for those of you that have grown up in the house of God, grown up in the church, the local church, you've heard the word unmerited favor. At this house, our pastor has taught us that grace, his definition of grace is God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. And I added to that definition several years ago when I was studying the word. And my definition for grace alongside of Jim's was God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. Now, grace is many faceted. You can't possibly describe grace with just two simple definitions because God's infinite and his grace is boundless. So we're not going to try to lock you into some kind of a perimeter of this is all it is, but grace is the favor of God. God's sovereign divine ability on my life to get the job done. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. But let me give you a definition of favor. In the Webster's Dictionary, favor is a preference. It is someone that is supported, someone that has a blessing, someone who is, there is a gift on their life. And the favor of God, and let me give you this definition, is God's supernatural influence on us and through us to bring his benefit. And his blessing. 
favor. It's a part of grace. It's not all of grace. It's a part of grace. It's a, it's a fragment. It's a, it's a facet of this amazing grace who is a person. So favor, the favor of God is the supernatural influence on my life and through my life to bring God's benefit and God's blessing. The supernatural influence of God on my life and through my life to bring his benefit and his blessing. You and I can't get anything supernaturally done without the favor of God. It's impossible. We need the favor of God to be able to, to expel us into things that we've never done before. Favor is necessary for uncommon success. Favor is absolutely necessary for uncommon success. If you're going to do what you've never done, and if you're going to fulfill the plan of God for your life, and fulfill your destiny on this planet, well, the earth time that you're here, you and I are both going to need the favor, the divine ability and influence on my life and through my life to bring his benefit and his blessing. Because here's the deal. I live in a very natural world. And I am in this natural world for a season, for a time, a parenthesis. Life is a vapor. And then I'm going home in eternity. Eternity is where I live. This is a parenthesis, this earth time. Eternity is in your heart. And God has said eternity in my heart. We are spirit beings. We are having an earth experience. But I'm a citizen of heaven. Do you know that? Do you know that you are citizens of heaven? You are not citizens of the earth. You're in this world, but you're not of it any longer. You have been made and formed and fused into this new creation. He's the head, you're the body. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. According to Ephesians, we are seated with him in heavenly places. Now, I know we live in a linear time and space matter world, but... He's in the supernatural and he's in the invisible world. So what was impossible in my world is possible in his world. What is not, I'm not able to do in this life, in this realm, in this time zone, God is able to get me what I need to get the job done by the favor of God. It is uncommon success. I can't work hard enough for it. And I can't work long enough to accomplish my destiny without the favor of God. Now, in the world, you've seen people that just seem to be at the right place at the right time. And it just seems like things just go well for them, doesn't it? You know people like that? People that are unbelievably successful. People that have lots of gifts and lots of talent. There is natural favor. But I'm not talking about the natural favor of mankind. I'm talking about the divine favor of God on my life and on your life to give us uncommon success in the destiny and purpose that God has for our individual lives. God's, I'm going to say it again, supernatural influence on us and through us to bring his benefit and his blessing. God's favor will cause us to do what we could never do. Genesis 41, 37, let me read it to you. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Now, I use this verse because I'm talking about Joseph in favor. Go with me to Genesis chapter 39. The favor of God will take us into a realm we were not able to get in on our own. We're not smart enough. We're not pretty enough, we're not young enough, we're not old enough, we're not talented enough to get the job done. We need the favor, the supernatural divine ability of God on our lives to propel us into the destiny that God has for us. Do you understand that? So that brings hope to me right there. That this isn't about what I can do. This is about my believing what God can do in me and through me. Are you with me? Case in point was Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer in the Old Testament. Joseph was the youngest son. There was 12 sons of Jacob. Joseph was the 11th son. He was a dreamer, and God gave Joseph a dream, and his parents were going to bow before him and his brothers. And you know the story. His brothers were jealous. They put him in a pit, and they sold him off into the slavery of the Egyptians. And off he went into Egypt. And there Potiphar took him, who was Pharaoh's 
He worked for Pharaoh, and Potiphar took him, and there Joseph as a slave, betrayed by his family, betrayed by his own brothers that should have taken care of him and loved him. There he became a slave in Egypt. And there there was a season of time where he was a slave, and then through, through a series of events, he was thrown into an Egyptian prison. And there in that Egyptian prison, in one moment, God took him out of the pit, out of the prison, right into the palace, and Pharaoh had a dream, and he couldn't understand it. And Joseph got to the palace, and in less than an hour's time, everything changed in his life. And Pharaoh said, let me read it again. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh after Joseph had interpreted his dream. And in the eyes of all his servants. Now all Egypt is bowing before Joseph. Who is this young man who's so smart that can interpret this dream that has troubled me so much? And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Joseph needed to interpret an impossible dream. He couldn't do it. God gave him the discerning of spirits, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, and it threw him into the place he was supposed to be. Favor will cause you to do what you cannot do. You are not able to do these things, but the favor of God on your life and through your life will take you to the right place at the right time and give you the ability to do what needs to be done at that moment, like Joseph. Favor. What does favor cause us to do? It'll cause us to have our petitions granted. When we're praying and when we're asking of man and God, things are going to happen and our prayers are going to get answered. Do you need answered prayer? Do you need people on the earth to do what you need them to do? Do you need the city? Or uh, Right now, Jim and I are in a building program, and I need the city of Redlands to give me favor and to okay my building project. I need the favor of the city of Redlands to accomplish what I need. You need the favor of your teachers. You need the favor of your employer. You need the favor of the person that you need a job. You need to be able to sit in an interview. And when you type out that interview, and when you type out that application, and you send it in online because they don't even want to see you face to face. You need the favor of God to be on that piece of paper and in that email and in that application so that it just shines out. And that employer just grabs it and takes it, and he doesn't know why. That's called the favor of God. Have your petitions granted. Get what you need. Esther, chapter 7, verse 3. Queen Esther, she was a beautiful woman, but there was a lot of beautiful women in her harem. She wasn't the only 10 in the palace. And yet God put a favor on her with the king so that she became the wife of the king. And when it was necessary for her to go to that king when she hadn't been sent for, she needed the favor of God so she didn't die. And it says in Esther chapter 7, verse 3, Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. I need my prayers answered. When I go to the throne of God, I need the favor of God to answer my prayers. Favor will surround me with protection. When there is danger everywhere, and when there is fear and there is plague and there's all kinds of things happening, when I'm in a war zone or I'm in a very difficult place, the favor of God will keep me. Psalms chapter 5 verse 12 says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. I need to know that when I'm in a bad place, I'm in a dangerous place, I'm in a fearful place, when I don't know what's going to happen, that the shield of God, the warfare of God, and the very arm of the Lord, the great and mighty arm of the creator of heaven and earth, will surround me like a shield. That's called the favor of God. What else will the favor do? It will cause my enemies not to triumph over me. You have enemies. So do I. Your first enemy is Satan. The thief comes to kill, to steal. And to destroy. He hates us. He hates all that is righteous and all that is good. He wants to disengage us from the king. He wants to disengage us from our faith. Disengage us from the favor of God. We are in a spiritual warfare and a battle with the invisible realm. And he wants to intimidate us. And he wants to triumph over us. And the favor of God will cause every wicked assignment over us and our children to absolutely fail. Our enemies will not triumph over us. 
Psalm 4111, for by this I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. Well pleased with me is the favor of God, that God is pleased with me, that God gives me favors and benefits and blessings. He gives me preferential treatment. That when I can't, he can, and he hears my cry, and he hears my prayer, and he knows where I'm at, and he cares where I'm at, and he comes to my rescue and my deliverance. That's the favor of God. I need it operating in my life in every season of my life. The favor of God will cause me to receive his life, his blessing, and his joy. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Listen, through this life of favor, there will be so, so, so many seasons where you don't understand what's going on, where there isn't any change, where there doesn't seem to be any movement, where things just seem to be stuck, where things are getting worse and worse and worse. Where the scenarios of life and the circumstances of life are piling up on you and you don't understand. It seems the better you do and the more good you put into something, the worse your life gets. It's like, God, where are you? Job said, I go here and he's not there. I go to the west, I go to the north, I go to the south, I go to the east and he's not there. Where are you, God? You see, there will be times in our lives, in our Christian walk, that it's going to seem like God is not there. Like God isn't real, like he doesn't care. It's called a crisis of faith. The enemy, again, is trying to disengage us from the love of God and the faith of God. But God says, I will be with you in trouble. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. His anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for your lifetime. As long as you're on this planet... As long as you were hooked into God, and you are, if you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you've said yes to Jesus. He is your Lord and your Savior. You have the favor of God. Favor can prevent tragedy. Favor can make you a household name. And favor can double your financial worth. So it doesn't just work in the spiritual realm. It works in the physical realm. The favor of God. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, God says in Proverbs, and adds no sorrow. God knows where the gold and the silver is. He says don't labor to be rich, but he didn't say for us not to work and to put our hand to something and trust God to make us prosperous so that he can cause the kingdom of God through us to be blessed. God didn't call you to be broke and poor. God called you to be children of God, standing up, believing God, and succeeding in this life. The favor of God is on us. The power to succeed is on us. That's what the blessing is, definition of blessing, the power to succeed. The power to succeed. God's blessing, God's favor, God's benefit is on our lives. Who has God's favor? Child of God, you have the favor of God. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. You may feel like a slime bag, but God says you're holy, blameless, and above reproach in my sight. Why? Because of something you've done? No, you cannot save yourself, but he has saved us. To the uttermost, he has saved us. He has so washed me. He has so cleansed me. He has so brought me before the throne of God, holy and blameless and above reproach, that now I have the favor of God in my life. Look at Paul writes in the book of Romans. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for me, who can be against me? When Jim doesn't like me and we have a fight, if God is for me, who can be against me? I need the favor of God to get that man to fall in love with me again for the moment because I've just pushed every button on his, uh, in his heart. When your friends don't like you, when your family doesn't like you, when people reject you, when you've messed up, if God is for you, who can be against you? Look what Paul says. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us how shall he not with him also freely 
give us all things. You see, now Jesus Christ has paid the price and every promise of God is now purchased by the blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says, All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Paul reiterates this and he says, Will he not with him freely give us all things? What do you need? What do you need? What is in your life right now? And what are you needing? And what are you believing? And what are you dreaming for? Will he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Holy, blameless, above reproach. It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Church, the king of the universe is praying for you. He is standing in the gap for you. He hears your heart. He knows your desires. You have but to ask. You have not because you ask not, and maybe you're asking amiss. But he says, ask. What do you want? Ask me. He says, ask and keep asking. He said, seek and keep seeking. Knock and I'll open the doors. The favor of God, Jesus Christ. My king and my God fused with me. And I am fused with him. He has not left me or forsaken me. There is such a lie in the church. And this is spawned by hell that he's up there and you're down here. And that you're somehow separated. There is no separation. There is none. None. Your need is his need. Your sorrow is his sorrow. You need a job. He has a job. You need your marriage healed. He has a way through it. You need your kids to come home from sin. There's a way out. They'll come back from, their, from the land of the enemy back to their own borders. You have a dream in your heart. You need God to do something that, that you can't do. You're too old. I know Jim and I were looking at each other. We're too darn old to do this. But the favor of God will speed up the time. Because God's not involved in time and age. He's involved in faith and eternity. <laughs> what does this all mean? It means God likes you. How about that? He actually likes you. Maybe nobody else likes you, but he likes you. He loves you. And he wants you to be successful in the plans that he has for your life. And he has provided all the favor you're going to need to get you there. So let's go on. We've seen that favor will cause us to do what we can never do, have our prayers and petitions answered, surround us with protection, our enemies will not triumph over us and will receive life, blessing, and joy. We found out that we have the favor of God as children of God. And now we're going to look at favor, which comes from God, but it flows through man. The favor of God, it comes from heaven. It comes from God. But God flows it through mankind. Favor comes from God, but it flows through man. I'm living in a corporeal human world, and I need the favor of man. So favor comes from God, flows through man. Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, he says, who is holy and who is true and has the key of David. He opens and no one shuts, and he shuts and no one opens. Jesus Christ is the one that opens up the doors through mankind for your life and shuts the doors through mankind for your life. Shut doors don't feel good, but sometimes closed doors are far more important than open doors. You're going to marry the wrong man, boom, it just gets shut as you give your life to Jesus. You want to have that job, you want to move to that place, boom, everything shuts down. Well, God, what happened? I thought this was it. No, it wasn't it. Why? Because the favor of God is going to open and close the doors. It comes from heaven, but it flows through man. The favor of God displays God's signature on your life. Joseph chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of Egypt, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. It's not on the notes, so I'm just reading this. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 3 of chapter 39 of Genesis. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, 
and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Potiphar saw something on Joseph's life. He saw the favor of God. The favor of God flows from God. It comes from God, but it flows through man. It is God's signature, his divine imprint and fingerprints on my life. Joseph had the favor of God, and Potiphar saw that God was with him. Look at verse 4. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. And then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. The favor of God comes from God, flows through man, will not keep you from suffering. Just because you've got God's favor on you will not give you this charmed life. You know, sometimes we think the favor of God is, oh, God, just give me a, just give me a good, just good, you know, just a good uh, parking place at the mall. <sighs> oh, God, I just need favor with this person. I need favor with that person. Listen, there's far more things at stake here. You know, you can pray those prayers and God can do that for you. I'm not saying don't do that. But I'm talking about something far deeper and far greater. And that is to accomplish God's plans and purposes for your life. The favor of God on my life and on your life is designated because there are specific things God needs me to do and needs you to do. God needed to save a nation, Egypt and Israel. God needed to get Israel to Egypt so they could be there for 400 years so the word of the Lord to Abraham would be fulfilled and God could bring Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. He needed Joseph there to save the nation of Egypt so it would be there when God needed it and to save Israel and get Israel there. Joseph didn't have any idea why his brothers betrayed him. He didn't know why he was thrown in that pit. He didn't know why he did the right thing and bad things came back to him when Potiphar's wife went after him. And he said, how can I sin against God and do this thing against God when she wanted him to sleep with her? And that landed him in an Egyptian prison. So what am I saying to you? The favor of God does not guarantee you're not going to have trouble. As a matter of fact, the favor of God can put you right smack dab into an Egyptian prison. It can put you right smack dab into a place you don't want to be. You're doing the right thing, and all of a sudden, boom, you get hit right between the eyes. Again, Satan is trying to disengage you and disconnect you from your faith in the favor of God. Well, God must be mad at me. Where's God? How come this happened? Maybe it's all part of the plan. There's a bigger plan than a parking place at the mall. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? There are nations at stake. There are souls at stake. There are generations at stake. And God has a bigger plan for our lives. And whether I'm comfortable or not comfortable, whether things are good for me or they're not good for me, I need to be in the plan of God and trust that the favor of God's working on my life, especially when it doesn't seem like it. Genesis 39, 20. I'm yelling at you. I'm sorry. I'm almost done. We are not going to get through all of this tonight. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. Verse 20 of chapter 39. Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with Joseph, and he said, no, I'm not sleeping with you. So she says, he raped me. So Potiphar puts him in prison. You do the right thing, you go to prison. That's the favor of God. Get ready. All those who live godly will suffer persecution. Satan will be out to stop you. If you are not persecuted, how come? What's wrong with us? Are we sitting on the fence? Can we not be a target for him? Listen, guys, this Christianity stuff is not for cowards. It's pick up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. If you're not willing to forsake mother and father, lands, homes, money, children, families, everything in this world, if you're not willing to forsake it for me, you're not worthy of me, Jesus said. He gave everything he had for me. Now he's asking me to lay down everything I am for him, to join the adventure of faith in the favor of God. Landed Joseph in prison. But in Genesis 39, 20, then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in prison. Wherever they were, it was his doing. 
The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. God can bless you in the pit. God can bless you in the prison. God can bless you in the despair. When the enemy thinks that he's got us, remember the favor of God will cause my enemies not to triumph over me. When I have done the right thing and I'm getting persecuted for it now, in the very midst of that prison, God comes in and his hand is on me, his favor is on my life. And in the midst of the worst case scenario and worst conditions of your life, the favor of God can be on you and you will thrive and you will prosper in that prison. The favor of God. The favor of God. You know, church, I keep waiting for this recession to be over. It ain't over. The Spirit of God spoke to me and said, don't look for this thing to be over. Don't look for the old ways and the old days because they're not coming back. He said, I want you to prosper and thrive now. In the worst conditions, in the worst situations, I don't want you to wait for things to change. I want you to begin to step into my favor and believe me in the midst of the prison that I'm going to put my hand on you and you're going to prosper and you're going to be, be blessed in impossible circumstances and impossible situations. There is no excuse for the favor of God not to be honest, no matter how bad things get. Because we are the citizens of heaven and we are the people of God. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Will he not freely, through him, freely give me all things that I need? If it's destiny for me to do a certain job, then there's not a devil in hell and one loose on the earth that is going to stop me from doing it. The only one that can stop me is me. I am out of time. Favor is not an accident. It's not something that just accidentally happens. God bestows his favor on us. It is not a wage to be earned. It is a gift to be received. The favor of God. You got kids? How many of you got kids? Did you ever have a rascal kid? But you had a good kid. And the good kid did everything you asked him to do. But the rascal kid was just contrary, rebellious, arguing, always coming up against what you wanted him to do. It was like, God, could you just do what I want you to do without arguing with me? Anybody ever have kids like that? Well, on the kid that didn't argue with you, that just did what you asked him to do, did you want to bless that kid? God said, if you be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will my heavenly Father give you everything that you need as the perfect Father? You see, I can't earn the favor of God. I can't work for it. It's not something, it's not a debt that he owes me. It is a privilege and a gift that he gives me. But I can put myself in the atmosphere of my father to produce his delight and his favor. And that is done through something called obedience. Obedience will bring me into the atmosphere of the favor of God. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 2. Now it shall come to pass... If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all those blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, willing, attitude, obedient action, you will eat the good of the land. If the Old Testament covenant that did not have the promises of God in the new covenant, how much more will the new covenant promises be available to those? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. When I abide in the love of God, when I come to the love of God and I just hunker down and just say, God, I don't get it. I don't want to do it. My flesh doesn't want to do what you tell me to do. But because I love you, I want to be an obedient daughter. I don't want to be rebellious. I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to be disobedient to you, Father. I'm just going to lay my life down. I'm going to do it. I lay my will down and I pick up yours. Not my will, but yours be done. Does anybody remember that prayer? You see, that puts you now 
into the presence of the favor of God. We don't earn it, but we receive it. I'm out of time, so there's going to have to be a part two. <laughs> Done enough for tonight. We need this favor. We need to know how to access it. We need to know how to recognize it. We need to know how to enter into its presence and the favor of God on us. We need to learn how to expect it. And I will teach you that in part two of this sometime. I'm not sure when. Maybe next week. I don't know if they'll let me, if they'll let me out of my cage or not because I can be the big mouth mama. But we do need to know how to grow in the favor of God and how to access the favor. So tonight, let's just review because it's, I've gone now 35 minutes. So let me just um, quickly just review the favor of God, God's supernatural influence on us and through us to bring his benefit and his blessing. God's supernatural influence on us and through us to bring his benefit and his blessing. Favor is necessary for uncommon success. It will cause you to do what you could never do. It will cause you to have your prayers answered and your petitions with mankind because favor flows from God but comes through man. Favor with men is what we need. It will surround us with protection. It will cause our enemies not to triumph over us. And it will cause us to receive his life, his blessing, and his joy as the children of God. Did you get something out of tonight? Well, we're almost done for tonight. Can you believe I stopped that teaching? I mean, usually I'd go on and on and on, so it's only quarter after eight. Wow, I did good. Of course, only got halfway through it, but it's okay. The favor of God. God's influence in and on us to bring his benefit and his blessing. How he wants to put his favor on us. How he wants us to accomplish what he's already ordained for us to walk in. He's already made it happen. We just have to walk it out in faith. That's why this is such an adventure. I mean, if you would have ever told Jim and I that we'd be doing what we're doing today, we would have said, oh, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that will ever happen. And I didn't swear because hell's a real place and a snowball would melt. <laughs> this is an adventure. This is an amazing life in relationship with the king of the universe who loves us. He likes us. Can you imagine? God likes us. He made us, and he's actually delighted in us. When we look at ourselves, and we think about ourselves, and we don't like this and that, and he's just going, oh, stop. You look like me. You got my nose, so watch it. He loves us. And I need to talk to you because maybe you don't know this incredible God. Maybe you're here tonight, and somebody brought you, or you showed up, and you're seeking, and you're just kind of wondering. And so I want to talk to you because God brought you here tonight for a very specific reason. He brought you here tonight to tell you that he does love you. And that he does like you and he does get you. And no matter what you've done, how bad you've been, if you've been a rascal, he's not in shock or therapy over it. He knows all about it. But he brought you here tonight so that he could talk to you and I could give you this invitation. Because Christianity isn't about a religion. It is about a relationship. And you and I and every human on this planet is going to experience something. It's called death. We're going to die. We're actually going to die. We're going to separate from these bodies. That's what death is, separation. These bodies are going back to dust, but my spirit and my soul are going to live forever. And I guess what I want to ask you is, when you die, where are you going to go? Where's your spirit and your soul going to go? Where are you going to go? Are you going to go to heaven with God? And if you think you're going to heaven, what makes you think you're getting into God's heaven? Or are you going to go to hell? And if you're saying, well, I don't believe in hell and a loving God wouldn't send me to hell, I have to talk to you because there is a hell. It's real. He didn't make you for it. But it's real. And he put in every provision that he could and went to every length that he could, dying for you so that you wouldn't go to hell, but you would live for him in eternity. But it's God's heaven. So we have to get there God's way. We live in this very prideful, arrogant teeming mass of humanity that says all roads lead to heaven and I'm going to do it my way. But you see, you and I can't get to heaven. You can't keep yourself alive. You can't raise yourself from the dead. And you can't time travel and space travel yourself to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, 
It's God's heaven and it's God's way. All roads don't lead there. Only one road leads there. It's a narrow road, Jesus said. And God said there's only one way to his heaven. And he said, you must be born again. You know, we're taught and we're told as Americans that if we're good, we're going to heaven. Good people go to heaven. But you see, God never taught that. He never said good people go to heaven. He said, this is what he said about humans' goodness. He said, listen, your, your goodness is like a filthy rag in comparison to me. Because you see, if you measure your goodness and if I measure my goodness against each other, we can clean up our acts a little bit and look pretty good. But God says that's not what it's about. You're not the standard of goodness. I'm the standard of goodness. I'm perfect, and you can't ever measure up. So your goodness can't get you to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ, his son. You say, well, gosh, you know, I, I, I go to church. I served God. I, I was a religious person. I, I tried to change my behavior. But see, that's not going to get you to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. His heaven, his way, you must be born again. Well, what does that mean, born again? And Jesus explained it very succinctly to a rabbi in Jerusalem named Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. And one dark night, because Nicodemus didn't want to come to Jesus in the daytime, he was a famous rabbi. He came to Jesus and he said, how do I get to heaven? The question I'm asking you, he asked Jesus. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, being a teacher in Jerusalem and a famous celebrity rabbi, said, how can that be? I can't be born into my mother's womb again. I'm an old man. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you don't understand. What is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. I'm going to a cross, Nicodemus. I'm going to be lifted up on that cross. I'm the only one qualified to take on the sin that has separated you from God, that has caused you to die spiritually. Your spirit needs to be reborn. And if you'll look at that cross and believe that I am who I said I am, I am the Son of God and the Son of Man, that I have died for you, that I'll be raised from the dead. You'll be saved. You see, it's not something you can do. You can't save yourself. I can't save me. I can only receive this amazing gift of salvation and say, oh, my gosh, it's real. It's true. It's all true. And, Lord, I need you in my life. I need you to be my Savior and my Lord. If you've never done that, then you're here tonight, and God brought you here so that you could do that, so that you could start this amazing journey with him in this adventure of faith and love and walk through the rest of your life in the favor of God and the goodness of God with your fate sealed in heaven, knowing that when you die, there's no fear that you're going right to him. And if you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, then you're here tonight by divine appointment to make that decision. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. Maybe you're a really, really good person, better than I'll ever dream of being, but you know what? You just never surrendered your heart and your life to him, letting him be Savior and Lord. Lord means boss. I'm talking to you. Maybe you served God at one time, but you know what? You just weren't serious about it. Some things happened. You backslid, and, but you know it's the right way, but you just don't trust yourself. But you're here tonight. I'm talking to you. So all over this auditorium, God brought you here because he likes you and he loves you and he wants to save you to the uttermost. You can't do it. You can only receive it. So I'm going to count to three. We're going to do it all together. If you need to get right with God tonight, give him your heart and your life with heads up and eyes open. Now, why do we do that at The Rock? Because we believe that if you can't say yes to Jesus in a, in a church like this, how can you walk out those doors and live for him in a hostile world? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Listen, Christianity is a relationship with a loving God. He gave everything for me. I want to give everything back to him. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid because this is not what it's about, but it's about saying yes to him. So with heads up, with eyes open, been running from God instead of to God, it's time to get right. Never said yes to Jesus Christ. It's your time tonight. Been a rascal? Oh, God loves rascals. You're looking at an old lady rascal that was a rascal so many years ago. And look what God's done in my life from drugs and dealing all the way through to pastor's wife, putting a family back together. Only God can do that. 
all over this auditorium. I'm going to count to three. Just raise your hands together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. Raise them high. I want to see them. I see that hand. Raise them high. Let me see. There's a hand. Oh, gosh, i got to get my glasses on. There's a hand. There's a hand. There's a hand. There's a hand. Wave them at me. Let me see you. There you are. I see you. There you are. There you are. If you, if you scratch your head, I'm going to count you. There you are. I see you. Oh, look at you. Isn't this awesome? You want to know him? You want to let him be your Savior and your Lord? Then let's do this. Let's stand up. If you raised your hand or if you didn't and you know you should have, this is what we're going to do. Just get your stuff. Just get out of the aisles and come meet me right at the altar. We're going to get right with God tonight. And you are going to start this amazing adventure with the God that loves you more than you can imagine. So just come forward. Just grab your stuff and just get out of your seat. Meet me at the altar. Meet me right here. Jesus, Let's get right with God. Let's just get right. Let's just do it. Jesus, I Let him have your life. He paid for it. He's the only one that can change you. You cannot change yourself. You can't be good enough. You can't work hard enough. This is only something you can receive. But he's a gentleman and he will not force himself on us. We have to say yes to Jesus. Quickly come if you didn't raise your hand and you're thinking I should. Just quickly come. Just come on. Just come on. We'll wait for you. We've got a few minutes. You're wondering, is that me? Yes, it's you. God brought you here tonight for a reason, a specific purpose. He has a plan. Wow. I know there's more of you. I know there's five more people that need to come forward. Who are you? Just naughty. Come on, just get right. I remember when I did so many years ago. I was so scared and so bad, just made all these wrong choices. Didn't trust myself to do the right thing because I couldn't be trusted. But then I met this amazing Savior that said, if you'll come and trust me, give me your life, I'll give you the power to change. And he did. He did. So we're just going to sing this one more time. I know there's five of you. I can feel you. I just believe the Lord said five. So if that's you, your heart's throbbing, you're thinking, oh, gosh, shut up. No, I'm not going to shut up yet. You've already, you've already seen how loud I am. Nana, okay? The loud Nana. Just come home. Come on. Because Jesus, I believe. We'll just wait. We'll wait for you. In you. We'll wait. Jesus, I belong to you. Your stubborn the little heart. That I live. He loves you. The He's real. That I he can handle you. Jesus, I he made you. I just have this smile on my face because I know you're just being naughty. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care. He loves you anyway. He knows what you're involved in. He knows how deep you're into it. He's the only one that can save you. So come back. I won't hold up this service any longer. But you know who you are. There's five of you. And he says, just come back. He's bigger than you are. And he's greater than your weakness. And he loves you. So here we are. Smile. You're not going to a funeral. You're actually going to get saved. How awesome is that? 
So let me see your beautiful teeth, your beautiful smiles. Look at you. Your angels worked very hard to keep you all alive, and they're having a party right now. It's an amazing thing. Amazing. Well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray with you. We're not going to pray with you here because we want to take you into the New Believers room, and we can do privately what, what we want to do and talk to you. And my husband wrote an amazing book, real simple reading, and we want to give that to you. And we want to offer you a spiritual personal trainer, which is a friend, which means you've got somebody you can call because you'll have questions. What's happening? So we'll explain all that to you. This is Dr. Becker. He's really a wonderful person. And if you'll just make a left turn. Is that right? Left? Is that right? I make a left turn and follow him.